Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Ross Wiener, the Executive Director of the Education and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. Thank you so much for joining us for today's release event and webinar on the crisis of student belonging that we are experiencing in our schools in the United States. I am thrilled and delighted that so many of you have decided to join us. I'm going to be very brief in setting a little context and then turn it over uh, to the amazing panel of experts that we have joining us today. Um, I will just say first that the chat function is open and hope you all will engage with each other and the question and answer, the, the question uh, function is also enabled. We're definitely going to leave time at the end of this for questions. So please be thinking about what you wanna know more about um, and we will get to those questions later. But now we're gonna dig into what for me, it just could not be a more important and timely topic to focus on cultivating a sense of belonging among young people in our schools. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we have an amazing panel of experts. First, we're going to hear from Professor Francesca Lopez from Penn State University. Uh, she co-authored with myself and Loren Cox, our policy director here at the Eden Society Program, uh, the brief that we are releasing today, A Crisis of Student Belonging. Uh, Dr. Lopez is a deep expert in pedagogy and in how schools uh, foster environments of inclusion and belonging that lead to uh, better outcomes and higher achievement among young people. So really excited for her to take us through, again, what is, you know, at, at right now in our current state, some harrowing data about the uh, acute distress that so many of our young people are feeling, but then we'll also share research on what we can do uh, to ameliorate that and what's school's role and what's all of our role uh, as policy leaders, as education leaders uh, in addressing uh, this crisis. Um, and then we're gonna get to hear from uh, two amazing field leaders uh, in response and filling out the conversation. Kara Kendall is the Vice President of Policy at the Foundation for Excellence in Education, herself a, a former high school educator a teacher, educator, and researcher, uh, and just brings a tremendous political acumen to this conversation. And then Linda Darling-Hammond uh, as well, uh, the president and founder of the Learning Policy Institute, the chair of the California State Board, uh, the former co-chair of the National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development uh, that was housed here at the Aspen Institute, and just uh, such an amazing uh, thought leader um, and field leader on, on so many fronts. So really excited to dive in. I will just say also in, in extending my thanks, I appreciate their participation so much. I also want to thank uh, the Student Experience Research Network, which supported this work uh, in, in coming forward. So if you go to the next slide, just in setting the briefest context, here at the Aspen Institute, uh, a couple of years ago, we released uh, We Are What We Teach, right? Just this uh, this this reminder that we need to recommit to the foundational purposes of public education. And we talk about those as helping young people develop a healthy sense of self, get ready to participate in American democracy, and get ready for work. And we framed this actually as there are these twin crises that uh, we have to address in the broader society around belonging and opportunity. So today we're going to focus specifically on what we know about the belonging aspects uh, of this crisis and, and how we uh, address it. And if you'll go to the last slide uh, that I'm going to walk us through, even more recently, we have then released um, this uh, crossing the partisan divide in education policy. And I think even as we see polarization, uh, right, taking hold in so many aspects of American politics and public discourse, we also recognize that there is a long tradition in history of um, of bridging those divides in education policy, and that's still happening right now, and it can happen on this issue. Uh, so that's why, again, terrifically excited for Francesca to bring the research forward, and then for our policy leaders to comment on how we navigate on this issue in these times. So without further ado, Francesca, thank you so much for your partnership and excited to learn from you today. Thank you, Ross. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you to our panelists. I, I thank everyone for joining this webinar. Um, we're very excited to release it. Um, and so in the interest of time, I will just add that um, part of the background as to why we decided to do this is we felt that there was a very huge need of connecting what the empirical evidence tells us should be happening in schools. Um, and so in our brief, 
what we start off in the introduction with is just a statement that says public schools have the essential duty for fostering a sense of belonging among all students, and that we really should be looking to the research to guide what we are seeing happening in schools um, so that we can improve student belonging. And we also provide in the brief um, a definition, and it looks like my slides are not advancing. So there we go. So what is student belonging? Um, we start off with a universal definition of belonging, and this is because Every human being has the need um, to form and sustain caring interpersonal relationships for our survival. And when we look at the classroom context, we're looking at positive relationships, feelings of safety, support, acceptance, respect, and being valued by teachers and peers. Uh, we also see terms in the literature that include things like connectedness, bonding, and relatedness. So all of these things together setting the stage for what we mean when we're referring to the term belonging. And so now I'd like to just turn to the crisis that we're facing. Um, it is something that Belonging is something that is essential to everybody. Um, the safety, support, acceptance, and respect is something that we know is predictive of positive outcomes. And one thing to flag is that they are also being threatened in our very highly polarized context. And so in looking to what the challenge is that we are facing, um, I'm going to pick out some very key highlights from the brief. It's by no means exhaustive in the interest of time. Um, and I look forward to hearing from Dr. Darling Hammond and, and Kara as well to hear about what are the things that we also need to be considering. And so consistent with some of the data um, that we identified both in the empirical research and what the CDC is telling us is we are not getting belonging right. Um, there was an issue that was exacerbated with the pandemic and we had an opportunity to kind of set things right, but we know that students are suffering. So globally, we have about a quarter of our students that are expressing that they have low levels of belonging in schools. In our US schools, that number reaches up to 40% of our high school students who are just not feeling connected at school. When we look at students who are minorities or members of the LGBTQ plus community, we often know that they have the lowest levels of belonging. And so the well-being crisis that we're looking at is not something that is relatively minor because what we are actually seeing is that students are experiencing epidemic levels of stress, of anxiety, of depression. They are expressing suicidal thoughts and hospitalizations that keep breaking records every year. And so we also have seen a significant increase in the share of youth who have seriously contemplated suicide, made a plan, and attempted suicide. And so this crisis is literally a life and death situation for our students in schools. When we look at the demographics of different groups, we know that our adolescent girls are not faring very well. About 57% of them, as well as nearly 70% of members of the LGBTQ plus community, reported feeling sadness every day for at least two weeks during the previous years. We have 33% of adolescent girls who seriously considered attempting suicide and about a quarter of LGBTQ plus students who attempted suicide in the previous years. In addition to that, across just about any measure, whether it's substance abuse, um, experiencing violence, mental health issues, um, as well as suicidal thoughts and behaviors, we see that female students are faring more poorly than male students. Now that doesn't mean that our male students are doing well by any means. It's just that our females are struggling particularly in salient ways. In addition to that, we looked at or attempted to look at data for students who have disabilities. And what we know is that much more information is needed. But of the information that we do have, we know that students with difficulties in learning or communicating report the lowest levels of life satisfaction. At the post-secondary level, those same students report greater academic related concerns, issues with distress, self-harming tendencies, and a lower sense of belonging. And they are also less likely to believe that their institutions have a commitment to diversity when compared to students who do not have disabilities. So 
On top of all of that, we know from the data, from meta-analyses, from much of the research that teachers are absolutely critical to cultivating a sense of belonging in students. Um, when teachers provide support, that is the key predictor to student belonging in schools. And we know from students that when they feel that their teachers don't treat them fairly or they're being picked on or they're not providing help, they tend to have a much lower sense of belonging. So in addition to the crisis that we see among students, we know that our educators are also experiencing issues with feelings of belonging. Stress, burnout, and the polarized context are all affecting our teacher and principal morale and turnover. So we found that, for example, the percentage of teachers and principals who believe that the stress and disappointment that has come with the job was worth it has dropped dramatically from 2016 to 2022, as you can see on the screen. And it's leading to many of our educators exiting the classroom, perpetuating an issue that was already there pre-pandemic. So now that we know um, in a very brief sense what crisis we're facing, I'm gonna turn now to some of the key things we know from research that do give us a sense of where we should go with the evidence for belonging. So first and foremost, we know that school climate as a whole and belonging at the individual level are very much connected. When a school has a st strong school climate, Students, staff, and families all feel that they belong. We know that these perceptions are aligned with four key areas of school climate, safety, relationships, teaching and learning, as well as the physical environment of the school. And we know these four categories are predictive of students' sense of belonging. So we also know that a feeling of belonging in school goes hand in hand with how engaged students are in learning. And this is tied to practices that are aimed at creating an authentic culture of inclusion and respect, one that fosters student agency, as well as the assessment practices that are perceived by students as being fair and equitable. So a key thing to consider in the data is that we know school climate is much more predictive of school effectiveness than just having test scores, demographics, and behaviors individually. And even when we look at all of those things together. So there's quite a bit that school climate explains in terms of the kinds of outcomes that we look to schools to accomplish. And so one more point with school climate is that we know that it is predictive of things that we care about, such as higher attendance rates, higher GPAs, graduation rates, college going rates, as well as higher levels of teacher retention and lower rates of suspensions and dropouts. School climate, in addition, is very predictive of belonging and belonging predicts motivation, social emotional func functioning, classroom behavior, self-efficacy, psychological functioning, happiness, self-esteem and self-identity. So many of the outcomes that we care about are very much driven by a school climate and a sense of belonging among students. Now, when students lack a self sense of belonging, they are more likely to be absent from school. So in many ways, looking at attendance data is often a flag for issues of belonging. And we know that when students are absent, there are both short-term consequences and very problematic long-term consequences that cut across academic, economic, social, and health outcomes. Some of these include things like school violence, substance use, mental illness, bullying, as well as longer term effects that are related to poor health and adult functioning. So the image that you see on the screen um, is from the Chicago Consortium of Chicago School Research. And what it highlights for us is that belonging is absolutely critical across all developmental stages. That said, there are specific contextual considerations depending on how old our students are and where they are on their trajectory. So in the very early context of early childhood, we know that children will exhibit serious consequences on their mood and self-esteem when they experience social exclusion. When students have struggles with peer acceptance, we know they have an increased likelihood as adolescents of dropping out of school and having encounters with police. So early childhood is incredibly important. In middle childhood, when students are in elementary school, we also know that adults and in institutional settings 
exert a substantial influence on the judgment children reach about themselves, about their peers, as well as their identity, which has predictive factors for later in life. So moving to middle school, um, it looks like, there we go, sorry, there we go. In middle school, we know developmentally, the needs that become salient for students are an increased independence from adult control, having the opportunities to have extended interactions with peers, being able to explore topics of interest and having opportunities to engage in increasingly complex forms of thinking, communicating and problem solving. And the issue is that through research, we know that middle schools are not structured in ways that promote these things. We also know from research that things get a little bit worse in high school. And I'm having issues with moving the slide forward. So there we go. Um, there's this mismatch between the needs of older adolescents and high school students. And for students of color in particular, if they've experienced an absence of their culture and heritage, this further undermines the sense of engagement and sense of belonging that compounds across time. So we do luckily though have quite a bit of evidence on interventions that involve the whole school, that involve the classroom and the curriculum, all of which are shown to promote students' beliefs about belonging through building their strengths and promoting positive interactions with students. And this aligns very well with what we found with the CDC's four key areas of recommendations that include adult support, which is basically giving the adults in schools the tools um, to be able to promote belonging making sure that all students have the opportunity to belong to a positive peer group, having a robust commitment to education, as well as literally the physical school environment. Um, and so in terms of what schools should do, we know that for students who belong to a stigmatized group, they tend to have more belonging uncertainty um, or this heightened unknowing of the quality of their relationships. This is perpetuated when they are segregated via tracking, when they experience doubts about their abilities that may not even be conscious via stereotype threat, as well as by a curriculum that might exclude the perspectives of people from their community. So it's very clear that these feelings of uncertainty can be reduced when students are integrated, when all students are made to feel welcome in a particular school context, and when there is a positive racial school climate. Curricularly, we do have quite a bit of evidence growing, looking as one example at ethnic studies that promotes student academic outcomes, attendance, and belonging. Um, very clearly as well as critical thinking in the latest study that I was able to carry out and published in 2022. And one of the last areas to look at is assessing outcomes, right? Because it's important to identify measures that capture school belonging to inform the schools on whether what they're doing is leading to the desired outcomes. But by that same token, it's also important, according to the research, to take this balanced approach to collect and evaluate multiple forms of data to monitor outcomes and achievement. And so just as one example, we have Elevate. There are many others in the brief that we showcase, um, but this is one example of providing teachers with information on the student experience, as well as research back practices that they can engage in their classroom. And so just leading up to ending um, my part of the presentation is that we know that one of the critical issues with our heightened polarized climate is that teachers are increasingly self-censoring. And by doing so, they're reducing learning and belonging opportunities for students that thwarts not only their feelings of belonging, but also in get, getting the experience to engage in topics that they need to become engaged civically members of society. And so to conclude, belonging is important for every single human being. It has incredibly important outcomes associated with it. Um, schools and teachers play a very important role and making sure that teachers and leaders feel that they belong in the community is also important. And there is a robust body of research that we can look to to help schools foster belonging and their students and teachers. And so as I wrap up, um, I just want to mention that we also informed an infographic that will be widely accessible that provides all of this evidence in a very accessible format. So turning it back to you, Russ. Uh, Francesca, thank you so much for 
bringing that information forward today and for your partnership uh, with us at Aspen for so long. It's just such a, a great context for, for learning and thinking about how to work the, move the work forward. Uh, so I want to then invite uh, Dr. Kendall and Dr. Darling Hammond to come in and, you know, uh, Dr. Kendall, I'll start with you, but really the question is is to both of you about, I mean, first, let's start with just any reactions, uh, anything you want to highlight from the presentation, any additional points it makes you want to make sure that our participants are thinking about as we get into this topic. Yeah, well, um, thank you, Ross. I'd like to start off by just saying thank you for doing this, because I think that it's a topic that no matter how we what we call it or how we frame it, it's on parents' minds, teachers' minds, community leaders' minds, et cetera. Um, I want to take a minute. I think it might be helpful for me to help the audience understand. So in Excel and Ed, we work deeply within about 30 states, and we have close relationships with state leaders, state chiefs, legislators, and policymakers in those states. And this is so timely because I have to tell you, um, among the top questions we are getting from those state leaders in this past year, um, there are questions about chronic absenteeism, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I measure it? What do I do about it? Why does it exi this exist? Which to the presentation goes directly to what we're talking about in terms of this lack of feeling of belonging in schools. We're then also getting a lot of questions that um, whether policymakers directly acknowledge it or not, but right to the heart of the perceived problem. So even when students are in school, they are disengaged from school. They aren't focused on school. And so um, in addition to trying to help our state leaders, and I can get into that later when we talk about recommendations, understand how you measure chronic absenteeism, how you measure engagement or a lack thereof, we're thinking in a couple of different buckets that I think both go to what Francesca is talking about and also maybe add on to that in a bit. So we're helping leaders try and understand how they can support teachers, school leaders, district officials. Um, and remember, we work at a state level, so we're helping state policy leaders think about how you, how you support these things and helping them to think in terms of teacher professional development, um, how we engage students. And, and really importantly, I think, because we need to think about teachers and belonging as well, they are deeply affected, as I'm sure we'll hear more about, um, how we train teachers and surround them with the supports they need to do what is effectively the job of a community in so many ways, right? Teachers are expected to be all things, and those of us who have been teachers can feel that very acutely, I'm sure. Um, the other really important piece that we're just getting a ton of questions about and we're supporting states through is this idea that, um, and I think there's some disagreement about this, but there's also a lot of correlational evidence that shows that with the rise of social media and cell phones, um, the work of Jonathan Haidt has gotten a lot of attention in this, in this vein, and especially its impact on, on females. Um, is, is quite disconcerting. And I think from the school perspective, um, the research that social media and cell phones can be a form of, you know, can be difficult for uh, mental health, can cause mental health issues, um, and also that they are a source of disengagement. Any adult who finds themselves unable to put down their phone at the dinner table knows exactly what I'm talking about. And so we're helping states think through what does that look like? And that takes the form of, an outright ban on cell phones to, you know, how do you provide districts with the tools and resources they need to be able to say this is going to be a cell phone free school, which involves, as we can talk about in more detail, a great amount of community education, buy in, among other things. I think one of the hardest things parents can do is be the one parent that doesn't give your child a cell phone, right? <laughs> That's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, the other thing that I'd like to just touch on is and I think we get to this when we talk about school climate, and I would actually propose that we think about it in terms not just of school climate, but really in terms of school culture and what you know decades of research might call school ethos. So although not necessarily directly related to this issue of student belonging back in the day, there's ample research that shows that when schools are organized around a specific mission, when people feel bought into an ethos, um, that school culture benefits from that, that students and teachers report higher rates of satisfaction. So we've seen increasingly, and this might be shocking to some listeners, but 30 states now have some form of robust school choice. Uh, we have 18 states that now offer parents the options to choose 
schools with something called education scholarship accounts. Now, this is not to make this a webinar about we need to advocate for school choice, but I think there's something really important in understanding that when parents have these choices and when students have these choices, oftentimes they are choosing school environments that feel better to them. And so that might be, they find a mission that they can bought into, be bought into. That might be to the point about certain vulnerable youth feeling more alienated and more at risk in schools or LGBTQ plus students, right? Finding a place where they don't feel that way. And so I think the proliferation of micro schools, uh, for example, is something small intentional communities. There could be something there. And I would put to us that, we're helping state leaders think through, and I think we could think through, how do we do that for all schools, whether it's in a district setting, right? Or where, whether you are in a place where you have more robust school choice options. The one last thing I'd like to push us on, and I'd like to say is that in this amazing research, this very important research, what I hope we don't lose is the importance of focusing on academics because these things have to go hand in hand. When students are engaged, they learn more, they feel more effective, they have that sense of self-efficacy. And we have for too long engaged in a sort of culture war stance, um, thinking about like the content of our curriculum when the fact of the matter is too many of our kids can't engage with the curriculum at all because they can't read, <laughs> right? And so that's something that we think deeply about. How do we, how do we make this a both and? and elevate the importance of solving this issue um, along with the importance of, of its impact on academic outcomes. Yeah, Kara, thank you for, for all of that. So much to unpack, but that last point is so important. This isn't, it, these aren't alternatives of belonging or ambitious academics. And they're not even, I think people sometimes have a sequence in mind. Oh, you have to have belonging. And then that makes it so you can do ambitious academics. We need to, ambitious academics themselves to be a driver of students feeling more belonging because they don't want to be coddled. They want to be challenged and feel like they are growing and doing important, meaningful things. So just uh, appreciate uh, th that point. Um, Dr. Darling Hammond, really excited for, just for what's uh, top of mind for you that we all need to be thinking about. Well, I agree with much of what Kara already said. So I'm going to try to reinforce some things and add a couple other points. Uh, I too, by the way, was a high school teacher, and I bring a lot of that experience to this question because high schools are not designed for belonging. And when uh, we talk about school choice, a lot of the new school choices are smaller, more intimate environments where kids can be well known, where they can get a sense of belonging, where the design of the school is actually structured for um, the possibilities of belonging to be greater. And so I just want to uh, underscore the fact that we can design for better belonging, uh, and we need to be thinking about that. Um, I, I will say as a high school teacher, you know, I, I care deeply about my students, but uh, in the factory model that we inherited, you know, I got 150 to 180 of them in groups of 30, five or six times a day, passing by in 45 minute periods, and you cannot care effectively for students if in that context, I did not have a teaching team to work with where we could share students and talk about their needs and, you know, support them together. We did not have an advisory structure where a small group of students, uh, which I know this was uh, mentioned in the brief and I really appreciated that, could be with a teacher um, on a regular basis longitudinally over time often two years to four years, depending on the school model that you're talking about, where there then is a point of contact for the family, where you can have student teacher family conferences multiple times a year, where there is somebody to call if there's a problem because the advocate, uh, the, the point person is, is identified for that, where you can do the kind of work around uh, building community and uh, social and emotional uh, opportunities for learning uh, so that kids won't be bullied. Uh, because if you do that throughout a school, you're replacing the social media that people are uh, trying to get rid of, you know, the effects of with the cell phone bans uh, with actual social belonging. And that has to be a, um, you know, a real, there has to be a time and a place for that, uh, as well as for then supporting kids as they're getting their college applications off and as they're doing other things that are supporting the academics. So I just uh, want to, uh, reinforce the fact that what we see, for example, in places that are uh, bringing chronic absenteeism down or, or didn't experience it to the same extent, are quite often 
um, the designs for belonging. Micro schools are an example of people looking for a way to be in an intimate setting that allows kids to feel safe. And that, as we know from the science of learning and development, actually promotes stronger academic learning, right? Because we now know that we learn more effectively in situations where we feel safe. There's a shared feeling that, you know, it's time to move beyond the factory model. We've had it for, you know, the last hundred years. It was designed to put kids on a conveyor belt, move them along. We adopted, you know, Prussian age grading. So kids move to a different teacher every year. Even though we know that we get better academic achievement out of a looping situation where there's more sense of belonging, more connection. Uh, we then have our you know, kids on what they call the platoon system, you know, running around every 45 minutes to a different class, seeing seven or eight teachers every day. Uh, that was never designed for belonging or for deeper learning or for a lot of the things that we're trying to accomplish today. And we need to then help structure schools for uh, effective belonging, for effective caring, and for effective academics that come from that attachment and that engagement um, that then can, then can follow suit. So I think that uh, one of the reasons we're seeing so many models you know, um, emerge now post-pandemic is because uh, people understand how important that is. And it's up to those of us in state government and in other policy positions to figure out how to make that not the exception, uh, but the norm. Well, and so thank you. Thank you, Linda. And that kind of tees us up in some ways really perfectly for the next conversation because I think and we've seen some of this coming through in the questions. Okay, so what are the most promising things that we're seeing out in the field? What, what you know, and how specific can we get for people with images of this is what it looks like when schools are getting better, when systems are getting better, and also to the extent we see it as policy being more proactive uh, and responding uh, to, to this. So Linda, maybe we'll, we'll stick with you if you could bring some of those promising examples forward. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we're seeing, of course, as uh, Kara noted, you know, we're all concerned about chronic absenteeism, but the places that uh, either didn't really experience it to the same extent or that have rapidly decreased uh, the rate of uh, absenteeism are those small um, environments. I'm thinking about, for example, in California, we have something called linked learning academies. There's 600 of these pathways. They're usually small schools or they are small academies within larger buildings in which uh, there's a business and industry partnership, you know, around a career pathway, the health professions or legal professions or whatever. Um, kids are uh, in a, this small environment. There's a teaching team that owns a group of students. There's an advisory system where they are with an adult over usually the four years of high school. Um, they're doing meaningful work, experiential work. They're doing their academics so in a way that they can see how it connects to the real world, uh, sometimes with um, internships and, and other things like that. And in places like that, uh, we're still we're seeing attendance rates well above 95 percent uh, because the kids want to be there. The teachers want to be there. The work is meaningful. They're known well uh, and they're getting the supports that they need. We see this also in community schools uh, where there's the sort of set of wraparound supports. But part of that is that the community school coordinators typically um, are able to reach out to the families and then to make the connections within the school so that the student is experiencing, and there are still a lot of students experiencing severe trauma, that we know what it is and we're able to support um, getting the resources to students that, that enable them to be in school and, and um, to belong. We have a school in San Francisco, uh, uh, Horace Mann Buena Vista Middle School, which actually now has homeless families in the in the gym every night. I mean, they actually, when when families have needs, they carry them into uh, a, a resource where they then get uh, access to stable housing and the kids can keep coming to school and talk about a sense of belonging. You know, the, the uh, belonging comes from the fact that everything is organized to enable families as well as students to belong. And I think the, the relationship uh, there is also really important. We, um, across the country, see um, a number of states that are really trying to uh, support these innovations. They're trying to say, how do we, you know, deregulate the places where the, the regulations are holding the old bureaucracy and the old factory model in place, you know, in North Dakota, where Kristen Baszler is doing some work in um, 
In Rhode Island, they've got a new strategy. In New York, they've just created a new set of options for high schools with very um, engaged and meaningful performance assessments organized around these new models of education. Uh, many states, I think about 30 states have developed innovation zones uh, for schools to begin to rethink the way they're organized. Uh, now, how you get that set of innovations then backward mapped into state policy is sort of the next challenge uh, because it's one thing to allow folks to um, some some innovative folks to innovate it's another thing to figure out how to let the system support that but we do see that where schools are designed in a way that is um, enabling uh, for um, students and families to be connected that it makes a difference I just want to call out one other thing uh, Marty West at Harvard has done these studies about the way in which um, more continuous grade spans actually make a difference in achievement. So kids who are in a K-8 model or who are in a 6-12 model um, where middle school disappears, <laughs> uh, which is an awkward place as Francesca noted, <laughs> and it's not designed for the supports that should be there for kids, actually do better. Uh, and then they have a chance to belong you know, over a longer period of time uh, to a community where, uh, where they uh, feel uh, membership and where they understand how things work and what to do. And the more continuity we have for children and for families, uh, the better off we are. And we see this in the outcomes um, in many places. Yeah. So I'll jump in um, and, and just kind of very briefly mention that another area where we have quite a bit of compelling evidence is under the umbrella of these asset-based pedagogical practices. Um, ethnic studies is one of them. It, we know that when students from marginalized communities have the opportunity to see themselves in the curriculum, to learn about their history contributions, as well as they learn about others, poises them to be members of a very pluralistic society in a very powerful way. And the study that I had mentioned that I had carried out we saw not only their sense of belonging increase, we saw their ethnic identity increase, their wanting to learn about other cultures increase, in addition to higher levels of curiosity. And we're not talking just test scores, right? We saw higher performance in terms of their high level, deep thinking, identifying issues, working with their peers and trying to solve those issues. Um, and there are many different examples of this across the country. Christine Sleater has cataloged a lot of the evidence that we have that's available out there. Um, it's incredibly important what we see when students who have not typically seen themselves in the curriculum then get an opportunity to dive deeply and see themselves and see the contributions and what that does for their racial identity and their beliefs in, the, in their abilities is very, very profound. So that's a, another area that merits consideration by schools, I think. Thank you. And Dr. Kandel, yeah, I want to invite yeah, you. No, I think I'd like to pick up on, on a little bit of what both have said. And Linda, Linda rightly says, you know, uh, backward mapping into state policy, things that we know might work locally can be really can be really difficult. But I think to Francesca's point and to Linda's point, um, not only peeling back regulations, but helping localities understand the extent to which they can take advantage of existing flexibilities can allow us to create more intimate schools, schools where, you know, students and families and communities have more input into the curriculum, which can be a very powerful lever. Um, I'd like to just give really briefly, though, a couple examples of states, um, state actions that I think are moving us forward in at least understanding, if not beginning to address this issue. We had eight states in the past year uh, pass legislation related to chronic absenteeism. And it's a very interesting mix of sort of carrots and sticks. Um, Arizona, for example, I think we have one of the highest rates of chronic absenteeism in the nation that we've measured, um, you know, said you that true, like chronic absenteeism isn't, um, shouldn't be considered truancy. And so in this, and I might, People from Arizona, if I phrase that incorrectly, please forgive me. But but the idea that uh, when kids have been out of school for a long time, we need to surround them with tutoring and supports, and we need to surround parents with education. So that mix of parents and sticks. We've also, as I mentioned at the outset, we're seeing cell phone bans in certain places, which I think is really interesting because the approach can be, how do you provide incentives or resources for schools? 
in districts to keep cell phones out during the school day, right? And that, of course, involves resources and monies. And that's happening everywhere from New York, California to Louisiana and Florida, right? So these are very, these are states with very different um, leanings, we might say, right? So it's not, I don't think it's a partisan issue. I think it's a kid issue. I think it's a family issue. And I'll, I'll close by adding one more thought. And that is, um, you know, we've got declining enrollment in a lot of our major cities and in a lot of rural areas as well. Um, suburban districts too. It, it, it's an issue that people are up in arms about, but I wonder about the extent to which we can use this as an opportunity to, as we think about school consolidation as maybe a necessity in some places, take the opportunity to say, we might hold resources stable, but think about how we can recreate smaller, more intentional communities and importantly, focus the resources in the places that we know are going to make a difference, right? So the teacher supports, the curricular supports, the, the rigorous academics, but also those small intentional communities that, as Linda said, can create the moment. I want yeah, to just plus I, one I, on that <laughs> because there's a lot of school mergers going on. Uh, and if you, in fact, we're working right now with um, Anaheim School District in California, uh, where they need to merge a middle and a high school, which could just become a 2000 student, you know, anonymous factory model. But they're taking the opportunity with some support to think about small learning communities within this building, how to create that, you know, longitudinal piece, the relational piece, rather than recreating you know, the old factory models. So just, you know, cell phone bans are also a way to try to get kids out of their, you know, both out of the bullying that can go on. I mean, there's a lot of bullying, cyber bullying, but also just out of, you know, relating to the phone. But then we have to think about what do we replace it with? Because it's not enough to yeah. ban cell phones. Uh, we then right. have to replace that with productive, you know, engagement and um, an environment in which kids don't have to fear bullying in which they know that they're going to be in a community, a caring community, um, and protected there. So um, it's the, the policy stuff always has to be accompanied by sort of an, uh, an educational intention and actions that will um, enable us to get to a different place. Yeah, really appreciate that. And I was thinking about that as well, that, it, you know, even with the phones and wanting to make sure kids aren't on their phones in school, what are, what's the positive agenda that we're filling that with? That's relational and engaging and uh, right, uh, getting students bought in. So I want to turn to the questions and, you know, Kara, Kara, you've made references to, right, this, this set of concerns cuts across political contexts. And yet we're at a time when Political context is a significant overlay, and we have to be thoughtful about that. One of the questions came about how does belonging relate to efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion in the field? And as those efforts are so uh, have become so polarized in places, how does that uh, affect how we think about pursuing this? And is this... Yeah. Is this a different, like one is belonging itself, a term that will be saleable and broadly popular with parents and other stakeholders, but also how do we navigate so that belonging doesn't become itself a polarizing issue, which would become, be, be pretty ironic uh, because it's intended to be about how we all belong. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, th there's no, <laughs> there's no skirting around the fact that we are living in an intensely polarized time. But I think the common thread is no matter what your political viewpoint, we all, many of us are parents, if you're not a parent, you know, kids, you, people across the country, across political spectrum, see this issue, feel this issue, many of us very deeply in our own homes, in our own communities. So I think it's less about focusing on the term, right? I mean, we might call it different things in different communities in different places, but as long as we're all um, coalesced around the idea that, A, there is a crisis. And as I said, I think that um, we, at least at Excel and Ed, have seen across blue, red, and purple states, right? People are naming this in different ways as absolutely this is an issue. And so that part of it um, doesn't, doesn't worry me. What I think we need to do is um, to the extent that we can create sound policies <laughs> that, that don't um, trigger the ideology. And, and I think you do that by focusing on community education, parent education, 
teacher supports and education, right? And a big part of this is those of us in the Wonka sphere, we, we talk to each other about this as a crisis and the data and all of the things. And at the end of the day, uh, the, the people that need to execute on this are parents and communities and teachers. And so that education piece is incredibly important. Um, I'll just really quickly in, in speaking with Dr. Jonathan Haidt, who's spoken at the Excel and Ed Summit a couple times, he talks about this as like to, if we are really going to get back to a place where kids, you know, Francesca, you mentioned like the ability to have be, feel independent from your parents in middle school, right? And, and, and the ability to, to focus and engage with other people. If we're really going to get back to a place where that happens, we need to be incredibly thoughtful about honoring and all ranges of solutions <laughs> and in assessing what the extent to which they work. And so I don't know if that directly answers your question about how we prevent this from becoming ideological, but I don't I don't think the issue itself is ideological as long as we don't fight about the words, which we're very good at. <laughs> yeah. Linda, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think that you know, some of the polarizing conversations that occur around DEI issues and so on are actually fears that um, the the um, students who are now getting more attention or, or maybe the um, beneficiaries of, you know, an ethnic studies curriculum will somehow displace the belonging of other students. And we have to learn how to build community in which everyone belongs together and where this is not about an us versus them. There's such an us versus them, what, you know, uh, phenomenon right now and um, sensibility. And, and we have to prevent people from assuming that that is the, the goal or the uh, strategy or the, the uh, outcome of uh, enhancing belonging for some students who have been marginalized should not, you know, uh, disbelong students who uh, previously were not. So I think there's there's part of that. There's uh, the word wars that um, Kara was talking about that we get into in the Waka sphere. Uh, hopefully this is not a word that will have to be somehow rethought <laughs> because people will, you know, uh, go to the core of what every, you know, person who cares about a child, parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, you know, uh, wants for them, you know, this this sense for, you know, this sense of belonging. And I think it's really important, I've mentioned families a few times, for families to feel a sense of belonging uh, with schools and a sense of engagement and a sense of participation and, you uh, you know, that can, again, that requires rethinking the way we organize schools and time in schools and relationships among adults. When you get to um, middle and high school, the odds that there is an easy way for families to be connected to schools and to the teacher when the kid has so many teachers and the teachers have no time and so on, drop dramatically. And these redesigned schools that we've been describing that uh, are, are, you know, create advisory structures and te teaching teams and so on for coherence around the child also create pathways for parents to care effectively for their children with the teachers. And so that's a big piece of this too. The belonging has to extend uh, to the families. Um, and then that will help teachers feel more efficacious when they're in an environment. I remember uh, in New York City where a lot of schools were redesigning in small learning communities in the 1990s and uh, this horrible school at Julia Richmond, uh, which was, you know, two thirds dropout raid and you know, police had to patrol in, in pairs because it was such a dangerous place and teacher shortages were extreme. They redesigned the school with small uh, schools within it uh, you know, that were connected to families and to um, kids in different ways with new designs. And now there's a waiting list of teachers waiting to get in. Nobody wants to leave because it's a place where teachers can be efficacious, where they can do the work effectively because they're in a, in a context that allows them to do it. And uh, so I think that, and, and then there's a sense of belonging in that, you know, um, entire complex. So it, it, we really have to think about all of the uh, ways in which the school becomes a hub for the families as well as for the kids. Yep. And I want to see if we can get a couple of additional questions in. And one, Linda, I think you may be the first to respond, but I'll open it to everybody uh, and, and give you a second to think about it uh, around 
What specific strategies can education leaders, educators use to elevate student voice and agency in elementary schools? And as you're thinking about that, I just want to reinforce something that's come up, but uh, Kara, you named it most directly around, look, the underlying constructs of belonging, of trust, of strong relationships, of challenge and support, those things actually cut across at the level of those are things everybody wants. It may play out very differently in different cultural contexts. And something that I take heart in, you know, Illinois has been using the five essentials survey for a very long time. And Chicago and its suburbs are very different than Southern Illinois. But they all agree, these are the things we want our communities to say are true. Our strategies for how we interact with young people and with parents, they may be quite different across those different contexts, but actually the humanity that people will say, yes, people here see me, I feel respected, I feel like this is a healthy place for me to be, those are all going to be true still. It's your how might be different. And so how do we have that, you know, uh, really regard that different communities are going to pursue this different ways, but let's name it as something we want everybody focused on. Um, Linda, I'd love to bring you in though on how do you do this in elementary school? <laughs> I, I would point to four, four things that I would think about in an elementary school. The first is that you just mentioned the school climate surveys that are used in Illinois. And so that I've seen across the gamut from elementary school to high school, uh, when those surveys are done, uh, discussions that involve the students about what, you know, what are they experiencing and what do they think it means and what should we do about it? And you know, teachers look at those things at the end of the year. Hopefully they're tracking their progress over time, but students can be very much engaged. Uh, and we've uh, sort of identified different um, it, it can be through a student council, but it can also be in every classroom where every classroom is having this conversation. Building classroom communities where it is a community in the classroom and there is time for discussion about how we feel and what we're doing and how we you know, want to be um, responsible to one another uh, in the community, building, building that kind of character. Um, I've seen student teacher family conferences led by students starting in elementary school. So the student owns the work. It's not the teacher with the grade book saying, let me tell you about what you know you did, but here's my portfolio of work and here's what I'm working on and here's where I've struggled and here's how I'm going to do my next thing. And the you know the voice is there in that context. Uh, and then the other thing that teachers need, uh, I always think about, is a two-way pedagogy in which they're learning not only how to give out information, so to speak, um, but how to receive information from kids about who they are, what they care about, and what they think. And that's, you know, it, there are lots of ways to do it. And it's, you know, can be in conversations in the classroom. It can be in one-on-one, -on -one, you know, conferencing. It can be in little exit tickets. It can be in, you know, all kinds of different ways. But that has to be a part of the pedagogy so that every student feels like they have a way. I know in um, some schools that I've worked with, you know, kids get used to the fact that they can always leave a little note for the teacher if they don't have a chance to talk to them about something that's on their mind. So they know they have voice every day and that, that there will be then... Um, you know, um, concern around that. Some of the experiments that they've done in psychology find that if kids get to write a letter to the teacher at the beginning of the year about what they care about, what their goals are, and so on, um, this is in the stereotype threat literature, uh, and teachers, you know, acknowledge the receipt of these ideas, their um, grades and scores go way up just because they feel seen. So there's a lot of ways to do it, and it can start in kindergarten. Mm. Uh, okay, I know we're going to we're going to close out soon. I'm going to try and sneak in one more question that's at the other end of the continuum. Somebody asked about how can really intentional, tailored uh, pathways, college and career pathways, how can they lead to an increased sense of belonging for adolescents? And Kara, I'll see if, if there's something you want to bring forward on that first, and then th this will maybe be how we close out. Oh, yeah, you're speaking Excel and Ed's uh, <laughs> language here we're talking about intentional college and career pathways. I think that, you know, we we know that, um, and I'm not talking about tracking here, so let's, let, let's clarify that. All students need to be prepared to do whatever they want. But in rethinking, we've been thinking a lot and with some very enlightened um, state leaders, I will shout out to Indiana that's been, I think, really leading the charge in thinking about high school redesign and how early it is that we can start to not just engage, you know, parents, but engage students 
in the what makes you feel effective, what what drives you, what are the things uh, beyond your core curriculum that you want to learn, and providing really high quality. I mean, so this is the key, right? So from the state level, we have to think about when we talk about pathways, um, what what constitutes quality, <laughs> what constitutes you know. Um, opportunities that are going to let students have whatever opportunities they need for a fulfilling life. But I think that certainly starting with engaging students in thinking about the kind of coursework they want to take in high school, in college, and beyond as they enter the workforce can be a really important factor in engagement and in creating a sense of belonging, because you can be with like-minded individuals. This this very clearly, though, takes it's, it takes a lot of work, folks, and it takes a lot of work to communicate, to educate our community about these pathways. Well, and, and just to bring back something you had talked about before, there's just an element of choice as well. When you've decided this is the pathway that speaks to me, that I want to be a part of, there's just a different level of agency or exercising and then a sense of belonging of like I chose here. So they have to be quality, there have to be real choices, but uh, that's one way. Linda, uh, Francesca, and let you have any last word. Well, just a plus one on that. I gave the example earlier of our linked learning pathways, which are these, you know, communities that are college and career oriented. It is not the old folk tech. It is not a tracking system, but it is a way that kids get access to an experiential set of learning opportunities in a small, you know, uh, caring community. And I think that that is really critical. I'm very um, interested in what Indiana is doing. Uh, Byron Ernest, who was sort of behind that as the state board uh, chair, um, and I co-authored uh, a piece for the Aspen Institute on uh, how we're trying to get at that kind of approach across the country. And I think that um, one of the things about both the choice and the nature of the um, experience that kids get in those kinds of uh, settings is that they are able to be um, immediately affiliated uh, with others who are joining common pursuits, which is another form of belonging. Uh, so I, I think it's critically important. And the competency-based elements of some of these uh, strategies that are emerging are going to be extremely important as well to move us past the old seat time um, captivity that we've, we've experienced. I'll just add, I was an elementary school teacher, high school counselor, but elementary school teacher. And kids want to belong. Kids want to express their voice. The students I had wanted me to know who they were. They wanted to connect with me. It was very clear and important. They wanted to know about my life. It's something that they want. And I think we could lean on student voice to help shape and move away from these factory models that Linda is referring to, right? Because it's, it's very true. That's not what they want. It's not where they thrive. And they probably have many more ideas about what it can look like if we co-construct these spaces with them. Terrific. Well, I'm going to have to close us out. I will just express just tremendous gratitude for all of you for the caring and depth of concern you show about this issue for your generosity in sharing it. I feel like there could not be a better context for releasing this brief and for calling people to invest in this issue, to engage in this conversation. We do need, we need policies that say schools have to be places of belonging. And we, then we need to build practices that respect that's going to happen in every community, in every school, a little bit differently. But how do we share knowledge? How do we make this something that we're bringing forward, not as a nice to have, not as just on the way to some other goal, but a core function and responsibility of public education? So again, thank you to all of you. Thanks for everybody for sticking with us. We're going to send uh, the recording to everybody who registered. Please engage with us. Um, we'll look if there's things in the chat that didn't get answered. We'll try to get back to you, but uh, join the conversation uh, and, and let's focus on building a culture of belonging in our schools. So thank you to each of you. Thanks to everybody out there for joining um, and take good care.